Divine Truth Interviews Jesus, Mary and others are interviewed by members of the media and the public. Jesus is interviewed by Mary Magdalene on the topic of Jesus' identity. The interview was held on the 5th of August 2013 in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. This is Session 2, Part 1. You're constantly asked to prove that you are Jesus. Hmm. Why have you not done that? Well, there are so many reasons why I haven't done that. So let's go through a few of them. Firstly, um, I'm not God. <laughs> now, people will say, well, what's that got to do with proving that you're Jesus? Well, for the majority of people on the planet, whenever somebody says that they're Jesus, all of the Christians basically assume that that means you're saying that you're God. And in fact, a lot of people assume, as a result of the Christian beliefs, assume that it means that you're saying that you're God. And I'm not saying that I'm God at all. In fact, I've said over and over again that I'm not God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, because I'm not God, I can't do what God can do. So God, God is omniscient. I'm not. God knows everything. I don't. <laughs> God uh, can look at the future and, and the past very clearly for back and forward as far as you know, the universe has existed. I can't. I am just a person, a man. And nobody really wants to hear that. Mm. So, so everyone, when they hear the words, I am Jesus, they automatically assume that that means I'm saying I am God. And therefore, they then want me to perform all the things that they believe God would perform. Of course, God wouldn't perform many of the things they believe either, in fact, the, there's proof of that, and that is that God's not performing them right now, so therefore God wouldn't do it. Yeah. Uh, God only does what God chooses to do, and there are reasons why God chooses to do things the way God chooses to do them. But because they assume that, I, uh, that Jesus is God, or they assume the Bible belief that, that I'm God, they then assume that I have to ha perform things that they believe God would perform, Ironically, which God hasn't performed <laughs> either. So it's a huge sort of uh, issue for people. And I feel that, uh, you know, the fact that I am not God confronts the majority of people's belief systems, even the belief systems of people who are not Christian, ironically. Mm -hmm. So what we find is there is this presumption, even in atheists when they're asking me questions, that because I am saying I'm Jesus, that means I'm saying I'm God and I should be doing... God-like things in order to prove that I'm God or their conception of what God would do and because I don't do those particular things that it means that I'm not Jesus. Now, there's a whole heap of illogical thought in that entire process. There also seems to be the assumption on the part of even atheists that you're saying that you're Jesus and that, and that you'll do exactly what the Bible even though they don't believe in the Bible, that you will do the things that it says that you did in the Bible. Yeah, I, so I, I probably was going to bring that up down yeah, the track. But sorry. Yeah. I think, firstly, it's important to focus on this issue of God, like what, what people's assumption or presumption is that what God would do. The reality is God has access to every place in the universe right now. So if God's not doing something right now, there's good reasons why God's not doing it. And just because Jesus is on earth, it doesn't mean, even if Jesus was God, it doesn't mean that Jesus would do anything other than what God's already doing. So I, I can't see any logic in, in, that, in that statement, you know, that, or in any of the belief systems about if I am saying I'm Jesus, therefore I'm saying that I'm God. And because I am not God, I am not going to be doing the things that God could do. And, uh, and I think that's very important for mm. people to understand. So that would be my first thing, I think, that uh, would need to be raised on the issue. Um, yeah, with regard to God and God's laws, the reality is God is never going to break God's own laws in order to prove or disprove something. And I think oftentimes humankind expect God to break God's own laws. Also, what humans view as miracles are not miracles from God's perspective. They are just the perfect enacting of God's laws. And in fact, what people believe is mir are miracles are not what I believe are miracles. I believe there is no such thing, in fact, as a miracle, from, uh, with the exception of the miracle of the creation of life, which God has engaged. 
I don't believe there are any miracles in the universe in, this, in the sense that everything that is ha or does happen in the universe happens for a reason. There's a law controlling the event. And so anything that happens in the universe will have God's laws controlling the event in some way. So, so you, a person might say, it's a miracle that the earth revolves around the sun. Well, I would say, no, it's not a miracle. It's one of God's laws. It's the law of gravitational pull that result, and speed and everything working in harmony with each other that a body, such as the earth, can travel through space going around another body that, that is much heavier, obviously. And, and the speed of which we travel determines the distance and so forth. So all of these things are not really miracles. They are facts about the creation of God, God's laws. And in fact, everything that happened in my first century life are just facts about the, God's laws. That's all. They're not miracles at all. They are, and what we see as miracles are only because we rarely see these laws being engaged on the planet. And because I was in a condition where I could engage more of the laws of God due to my condition of love, I then could put into practice more of God's laws than the average person could do in the first century. And that's the only thing that caused any of the miracles to occur. So you're saying healing people of illnesses, that you were just acting in harmony with some of God's laws in a way that we commonly don't act Oh, we Today on the Earth. Most people on the planet have no knowledge of them at this point in time. And so therefore they cannot engage those particular laws. It's a, it's a bit like before we discovered the law of aerodynamics, we only engaged generally the law of gravity. Mm -hmm. Or we also engaged what's called lighter than air forms of transport. So we, we could not engage any heavier than air forms of transport because of not knowing the law, the law of aerodynamics. But once we knew and understood the law of aerodynamics, now we can engage heavier than air transportation, controlled transportation through the air by engaging another law. And it's only because we know that law that we can engage that particular thing. And it was exactly the same with me in the first century. It was only because I knew more laws than the average person and could engage them because of my condition and love, that I could do anything in harmony with what God would do. Mm -hmm. and, and this proves that I am not God, mm -hmm. because the reality is I am fully governed by all of God's laws, just as the average person is. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I don't see any so-called miracle as being a miracle. It's, to me, it's not a miracle. It's just an engagement of another law that the majority of people didn't know or understand at the time. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. It's not anything special other than that. And while it is amazing discovering God's laws and then being able to engage them, it's not a miracle. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a fact of life. It's a thing that God's created as a fact of life. And we, as humanity, only do not engage it because we don't know. We have not yet discovered all of God's laws. And in fact, my opinion is we've discovered very few of them. And as a result, we almost see anything as a miracle when it's not really a miracle. So then you're saying that one of the reasons why you haven't proven that you're Jesus is that you're not God and a lot of people want you to prove that you're God in actual fact. Exactly. Yeah. And it's impossible for me to prove that I'm God because I'm not God. I've, yeah. told, I've said to people, I am not God. And if you want to believe what the Bible tells you, or I would actually argue that it's not even what the Bible tells you, but rather your interpretation of what the Bible tells you. Mm -hmm. And if you would like to believe that, then that's up to you. But it's not true. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and therefore, any desire that you have for me to prove that I am God uh, or prove that I should be able to do God-like things, are all just based on completely erroneous information, <laughs> and, and and really, I can't engage any of those any of that form of proof. Okay, so um, you're saying that you're not God, and so you're never going to prove that you're God. Yeah, um, and I'm never going to be able to do the things God would be able to do. Yeah. Mm. What about this issue you've just mentioned, the Bible, and that it's not fully factual? Mm. Well, that's the other thing, isn't it? That a lot of people ask me to do things that the Bible says I did in the first century. 
Now, of course, most of what the Bible says I did in the first century, I didn't actually do. <laughs> so that, that's, a, that's interesting in itself. Like, the reality is things like walking on water, turning the water into wine, multiplying the loaves and the fishes, these were all embellishments by people who were, who were quite deceitful after my death, who wanted to embellish my life in order to gain converts to Christianity. And it wasn't even the Christianity I taught. It was, a, it was already a modification of what I taught. Mm -hmm. So they were trying to gain converts using me as some kind of um, so-called God that did all these special things, which I never did. I never claimed to be God on earth in the first century and I never claimed, I've never claimed so since either. Mm -hmm. It's only people after me who have claimed those particular things. Now, some of those people claimed that because they did actually think I was God because of the things that I did, and, and they are wrong. Like, it's just that they're wrong. They're, they're, like I said, I don't see anything, any so-called miracle as being a miracle. Mm. It's just engaging the laws of God in the manner of understanding. And so many of the things contained within the Bible are false about my life. Now, when people say to me, well, you should do this because that's what you did in the first century, I go, well, firstly, I didn't do that in the first century for a lot of reasons. And secondly... I'm not going to do the same things I did in the first century again um, either. Like I've grown 2,000 years. It's not like I'm the same person as I <laughs> was then. I've changed quite significantly since yeah. then. And so I'm not going to do the same things that I did in the first century. And also what the Bible says I did in the first century is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. That's not what I did. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and there are some things that are right uh, and some things that I said are actually in the Bible, in the way that I actually said them and so forth. But there's also quite a lot of things in there that I did not say, never would say, and never could say because they were wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, to actually then want me to do something that the Bible says I did in the first century, which I never did, is not a logical proof that I am Jesus. Mm. Okay, so you're saying that a lot of what's contained in the Bible about your first century life <coughs> is not factual mm -hmm. and so you're never going to do you didn't do them then you're not going to do them now no there are some things that you did you said just now that there are some things that are recorded in the bible that you did do certainly um so why aren't you doing them now well this bring, comes to the point of what happens when you become at one with god see in the first century as is recorded in the bible there was no record of me ever performing any so-called miracle which, which remember i've said that there's no such thing as a miracle anyway but there's no record of me performing any so-called miracle before i was 30 years of age after my baptism with john by john which which i was in my 31st year by the jewish reckoning of counting and and i before then could not perform any of these things now I had a choice before then of how to perform things. One way was that I could allow myself to be overcloaked by a spirit. And many people do this today where they let themselves be overcloaked by a spirit and then they can perform something that the average person on earth can't perform, Such as, but which the spirit knows about. Yeah. Like, for example, reading a person's mind. Mm -hmm. They might be able to read a person's mind. Every single person on earth can do it once they engage the law. Mm -hmm. once they understand how it works. But the person who's doing it is only just having a spirit tell them the thoughts of another person. And they're open to the connection between themselves and a the spirit. Now, I decided in my first century life that I didn't want to do that. I felt it was quite deceitful. I felt it was, uh, it was an erroneous position that a person on earth formed because of some unhealed emotion. And the spirit did worked through them for some reason that the spirit had as an unhealed emotion, which was out of harmony with love. So I didn't want to engage doing anything special using a spirit to, to overcoat me. So I decided all I wanted to do was become at one with God in the way that God displayed love. And then if God wanted to do anything through me, then, then I would be that vehicle, if you like, to get those particular things done. And it was only by engaging the law that I could do that. I understood that. Mm -hmm. I understood that God's laws were very 
uh, much defined by God and were very fixed and immovable. And all I needed to do is bring myself into harmony with the way in which those laws operated in order to perform certain things. So it, came, it became before I was 30 years of age, I could not perform any so-called miracle unless I allowed a spirit to overcloak me, which I did not wish to do. Mm -hmm. Now, after I was 30 years of age, I became at one with God. And just before my baptism by John, I became at one with God. At that point in time, I knew far more of God's laws than the average person who lived on earth, including John himself. As a result, I could engage some of those laws, which included being able to heal people under certain circumstances, mm -hmm. as long as the law was engaged. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't heal everyone. I only healed certain people under certain circumstances because the law could be engaged in their, in, in their position. And I didn't, uh, you know, cure the lame either unless the law could be engaged in a certain way. Then I could cure the lame because once the law was engaged, then I could engage the process. So this is the only way in which anything can be done, in fact. The law must be engaged in order for anything to be done. You cannot break God's laws in order to perform miracles. All of the so-called miracles are just new laws that mankind has not discovered and I wouldn't call them even new really because from God's perspective they've existed forever <laughs> right from the inception of our universe right until now they've existed so these are laws that exist that we have to learn how to engage and really it's like a scientific process of discovering what those laws are as to how to engage them in the first century I discovered a lot of laws and therefore I knew how to engage them and in this life, once I go through the process of getting or back to the condition that I want to get through by engaging the laws that are involved in getting into that condition, I will be able to perform many different things, even better things that I performed in the first century. That, that is my belief at this point in time because I know more of the laws than I did then. Mm -hmm. However, it's not going to be miracles. They're not going to be miracles from my perspective. They're just going to be engaging the law. So, but perhaps <coughs> they look like miracles to other people. They would be the kind mm. of thing that some people wish for you to perform at the moment. Yes, Is that and, and uh, it's illogical for them, as we'll discuss in this, in this FAQ session, it's illogical for people to assume that just because I can do one thing, it's proof of my identity, because it isn't. Yeah. All it's proof of is that I can do that thing. Yeah. So, so it's a bit like saying, you know, if you can fly, then it proves that you're Jesus. No, it doesn't. It just proves that you can fly. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't prove anything else. Yes. And that's the thing we need to bear in mind. All right. So you've, you've just let us know that basically you could do certain things that people would perceive to be miracles in mm. the first century. People would even perceive them perhaps to be miracles now mm -hmm. if you could do them. Mm -hmm. But at this point, you're not yet at the state of atonement with God again. Is Correct. that, yes. And, and, and the main reasons why I can't perform things now is because love has not been perfected inside mm -hmm. of myself. And for, for that to occur, all fear that exists within inside of me has to leave. And that's the process I'm going through and God's been taking me through for the past 15 or 17 years now of releasing fears, releasing fears until I can get to the point where the love that exists within is, is, is in harmony with God's love. God's love has no fear involved in it. And so for me to be in harmony with God and therefore be able to do these things, I have to obtain that condition through my own choice, through my choice to release fear, basically. And that will take time. It's going, it's a, in the first century, that took me around 13 years of time uh, from the time when I actively engaged the God's laws and I realised that there was this law involving love and that was that fear and love could not coexist mm -hmm. at the same time. And so I realised that I had to go through a process which took 13 years to engage in my first century life. Now, at the moment, I started engaging this process when I was 40 years of age or 41 years of age. I've been doing it for nine years now uh, in terms of this process. God had been leading me through this process for much longer than that, of course, but it was only when I became fully conscious or aware myself of what the process involved, which was nine or so years ago, that I realised what I had to do. Mm -hmm. And what I had to do was release all of my fears, which I'm still doing. And... and 
That might take another, well, in the first century it took 13 years, and I've been doing it nine years so far, so it's at, probably at least going to take another four. You know, as a minimum, mm -hmm. it's going to take another four years. So it will be at least another four years probably until I can engage some of these laws. Now, it's true that some of those laws might be able to be engaged before then, depending on my memory of them and how much in harmony with love I am at the time of engaging the law. So at the moment I have a memory of all the different laws I can engage, but I'm not harmonious in, with love with regard to engaging those particular laws. So that's going to take some time to develop. Yeah, so, sorry. Yeah. So you're, you're saying that basically you're in this process of bringing yourself back into alignment with a set of laws. Yes. And once you are, then you'll be able to do certain things that currently I can't do. You can't do because yeah. we're all bound by God's laws. And and because and the primary reason why I can't do them is because fear exists within me, and fear is not harmonious with love, and there's so so therefore fear is not harmonious with law, mm -hmm. with God's laws. I'm talking mm -hmm. about not human laws. Of course, in human laws, there's millions of laws that are created out of fear, <laughs> but not God's laws. None of God's laws are created out of fear. So, so I must engage. God's laws in the same manner that anyone else would engage God's laws if I am ever going to do things that are new that have not been done on this earth. Now, other people may see them as miracles, but I don't see them as miracles. They're just me knowing another law, like you know, mankind knowing the law of you know, aerodynamics now, uh, not just the law of gravity or the laws of engaging lighter than air flight. Now, he engages the laws that can engage heavier than air flight. And, uh, and that's only because we know more laws. That's the only reason why. And this is the same principle that we'll be engaging. Yeah. Okay, so um, you've spoken about this journey back towards alignment with the laws. Mm -hmm. Once you're there, does that mean that you'll be doing miracles willy-nilly everywhere? <laughs> Or you no, mentioned no, as usual, all of the so-called miracles are just engagements of law. So where the law permits me to engage a process that other people believe are miracles, but which I see as just engaging the law, I will engage the law when I'm driven by love to do so. I, I won't engage, I won't be able to engage it if I wasn't driven by love to do so, because in that place you have to be harmonious with love before the law can be engaged. So what would be an unloving use of performing a miracle? Or well, what would motivate you? Well, you know, we see a lot of these happening on earth today where a spirit overcloaks a person on earth who doesn't understand the law. The spirit understands the law. The person on earth doesn't understand the law. But the spirit overcloaks the person on earth and does so-called miracle through the person. Now, to me, that's... Uh, while it's great that the spirit did it, it's not very good because it's deceitful. It's not true. The person on earth isn't in the condition where they understand the law. They're only being assisted. And if they told the truth and said, look, I'm being assisted by a spirit, now we'd be in harmony with more truth. That'd sure. be fantastic. That's not the kind of thing I want to do. What I want to do is show the potential of the human species without having somebody assisting you all the time. Only through this connection with God. That's what I want to demonstrate to people. I don't want to demonstrate what can anybody can do, which is allow yourself to be overcloaked by the will of another person, pushed around by a person. Whether they're seen or unseen matters not to me. They're still pushing you around and manipulating you into doing something that you believe is right perhaps, but, but it's deceitful and it's out of harmony with love. You're not going to be able to fully engage miraculous things in that place. So I don't want to do that. I just want to engage the law in that pure space. It would get a lot of people off your back, though, wouldn't it, if you just suddenly <laughs> did some miracles? Why wouldn't you do that? Well, I am not going to engage these processes just for some egotistical reason. And, in fact, if I attempted to, I would be automatically out of harmony with the law of love. Mm -hmm. So you can't engage these things for some egotistical reason, you know. Un, unlike, uh, I am not like people claim me to be. I'm not narcissistic or egotistical. I have no desire to, to do something which helps another person just because it helps me. 
And so I don't have any desire just to turn the water there into wine just so that you will believe that I'm Jesus. You know, that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I don't have any desire to turn water into wine anyway, which we can discuss at another, <laughs> at another question and you'll see why. But, but all of these so-called things that people want me to do are often just to prove to them something. There's no loving reason for doing it at all. And in fact, for many of them, no matter how much proof I furnish about my own identity, they would still not believe me anyway. Mm -hmm. And many of them say that to me, in fact. No matter what you did, why had one man say to me, no matter what you did, I still wouldn't believe you're Jesus. Okay, well, what can I say to that? Fair enough. <laughs> Does that bother you? <laughs> no, not at all. It doesn't worry me that people don't believe I'm Je that I'm Jesus. Like, I know who I am. It's like, it's like me saying to you, I... Like, no matter what you do, I will never believe you're Mary Magdalene. Or, you know, saying to Igor, no matter what you do, Igor, I'm never going to believe that you're Igor. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> what can you say to that? <laughs> Not much at all, really. You're like, it's a very illogical, uh, you know, thing to say. And it's a very illogical thing to do. And also, I believe in their future. Many of them will will turn around from that very illogical statement and go, yeah, I was a bit of an idiot, you know, saying, even saying that's a bit idiotic, actually. Why is it idiotic? Well, it's idiotic, firstly, because it's illogical. Like, you know, you know you're basically saying that you're not going to believe anybody is anybody, no matter what they do. <laughs> you know, that, you know what, what sense does that make yeah. from a philosophical perspective? None whatsoever. Yeah. Um, you know... And, you know, this is the thing, is that because they have all these beliefs about Jesus, of course, they have all of these ideas that make no logical sense when applied to another person. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, I, and I put to these kind of people that basically it's their belief systems that prevent them from analysing anything, I say, with any logical uh, thought, you know, with any, without it, with any clear thinking because their belief systems preclude it. And while your belief systems preclude any logical thought, it's impossible to help you, mm. both here on earth and in the spirit world. Now, sooner or later, events of life will confront these illogical thoughts and help you see that they are pretty illogical and at some point in the future you may change. For example, once the atheist arrives in the spirit world, he realises realise there's a spirit world. A lot of people laugh at me when I talk about a spirit world. Well, when you arrive there, you won't laugh at me anymore. You'll realise there was one all yeah. that time. Yeah. You still might not believe I was Jesus, of course, but, but you'll at least know that I spoke the truth on that issue. <laughs> and this is what I find for the majority of people. It's not until they actually speak to the people I know in the spirit world that they'll actually accept that I'm Jesus. Mm. But we can talk about that later too, yeah, as sure. to what, what is the only way that anybody is going to be able to prove that Jesus. All right, <laughs> so if we address that in another question, mm. uh, how you could possibly prove it. Yeah. The, the original question I asked was yeah. that, you know, you're constantly asked to prove that you're Jesus. Mm. Why haven't you? And you've basically spoken about how other people desire you to prove it, haven't you? Yeah. So you've sort yeah. of mentioned that you're not God and so you can't prove yeah. that you're God, yeah. that you're not, um, you didn't do everything that's stated in the Bible, Bible. and so you're not going to end up doing those things again. Exactly. That when you did do certain things that are recorded in the Bible, you were at one with God. Of course, and, and I'm not at one with God at, at this point yet because of the fear that exists within me on different subjects. Yeah. And, and also that you're not, you're not going to use, uh, you're not going to do things in an unloving way to make life easier for yourself perhaps. No, to... and in fact it would be impossible to do so. Mm. You know, I'd not, I can't engage laws of love while at the same time being selfish and narcissistic and self-involved. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. So, you know, if I'm selfish, narcissistic and self-involved, I'm not going to be able to do anything, in fact, <laughs> yeah. that, anybody, that, that anybody else hasn't done. On the planet. Which is quite ironic, isn't it? Because um, if you suddenly just did perform a miracle, it might make uh, a lot of people um, suddenly believe that you're Jesus. But in that same act, you'd be doing something that's narcissistic exactly. and self-involved. So everyone would be happy with that. And yet it would prove it would your lack of love. It would prove the lack of love. Yeah. And it would actually prove that I am narcissistic and self-involved. That's the sad thing about it. I find that quite amusing because I'm often 
accused by the media or others that I am narcissistic and self-involved and so forth. And yet, if I do what they want me to do, that would make me such. Mm -hmm. So again, illogical. (laughs) The the, the claims are illogical. So um, I don't know if I've covered all of those points. Yes, so just the... um, uh, the final point was that you're not yet at one with God again, yeah, and yeah. I think you covered that. Um, yeah, so, so for all of these reasons, it's impossible for me to engage proof that the people generally who ask me these questions want. Now, there's plenty of proof of who I am, actually, already presented. There's, like, there's obviously a thousand, over a thousand hours of video presentations where I talk about things that are not heard of on this planet ever before. So, so, you know, you could choose to watch all that. But the majority of people don't do that because they already, they hear the claim he's saying is Jesus and then they go, that's impossible. So they say that's impossible without hearing a single word Mm -hmm. that I've ever spoken generally. Or they're critically analysing, trying to critically analyse every single thing I say, trying to prove that I'm not. And, and it's not a very logical way to proceed if you're trying to find out whether Alan John Miller, who claims to be Jesus, is actually Jesus or not. Also, it doesn't matter. That's the irony. It doesn't matter to anyone other than me who I am. <laughs> um, if it matters to you, it's only because of your belief systems that, you, that would be confronted if you accepted that I was Jesus. Mm-hmm. So if it matters to you, you know, who I am, that's like it mattering to me who you are. Why would it matter? Why, why wouldn't I just let you be you? It doesn't matter in any way unless I have a personal investment. And I suggest to the majority of people who ask these questions is they have deep personal investments in what they believe Jesus to be. And as a result of that, project at me all sorts of things because of their deep personal investments. All of their projections are unloving. They're never going to be at one with God while they have them towards me. Because remember I did say, and it is recorded in the Bible, that he who judges another is going to be in deep trouble. He who's angry with another is going to be in deep trouble. According to Matthew chapter 5, it says that if you're angry with me, you're going to be cast into Gehenna, is what it says in Matthew chapter 5, if you believe your Bible. Of course, I never said that, but, but that's what Christians believe. If you're angry with anybody... According to Matthew chapter 5, you'll be cast into the everlasting hell fire, Mm. according to what the Bible says. Now, I don't agree with that, but if you believe your own Bible, then you need to stop being angry with me for claiming that I'm Jesus. Mm. Right? According to the same uh, same passage of verses in Matthew chapter 5, it says that you must love your enemy. Now, I suggest to you that... You know, I've had a lot of, as you know, emails from Christians saying they want to shoot me. In fact, I had a radio talkback show where a Catholic Christian rang up and said, I need a bullet in the head. That was her her statement. And I go, yeah, that's very interesting. You know, that's very out of harmony with Matthew chapter 5 where you would love your enemies. Now, if you love your enemies as your friends, you're saying you'd put a bullet in your head of your friend, would you? No, I don't think so. So if you're saying you'd do that to me, you're way out of harmony with your own belief system, let alone what the truth is. So, so I would suggest to such people that they, that they look at their personal investments in why they want me to prove that I'm Jesus and instead listen to what I'm saying with an open mind for a change. That's what I suggest. That's what people in the first century had to do too, by the way. Ironically, mm-hmm. they had to do exactly the same thing. Mm. Mm. Why don't you speak Aramaic to prove that you're Jesus? <laughs> this has to be one of the most ridiculous and illogical, stupid questions that I've ever heard, to be frank. Um, it, it goes along with many other stupid questions that I'm often asked, I feel. Now, I say stupid because, and illogical because it, it, it is totally st- crazy to believe that just because I spoke Aramaic that somebody would believe that I'm Jesus. But the reality is that Jim, is it Cav, 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 Cavizel, Cavizel, I think, I don't I think know. is the way you pronounce his last name, who played me in The Passion of the Christ, spoke Aramaic for nearly two hours. <laughs> A lot longer than that, I'm assuming, yeah, if he had exactly. the rehearsals. And... and if that's the case, then that proves that he's Jesus, does it? No, it only proves that he can speak Aramaic. That's all it proves. It proves nothing else. And this is a measure of people's illogical reasoning. 
If I spoke Aramaic, the only thing it would prove is that I can speak Aramaic. It doesn't prove that I'm Jesus. If it did, then there'd be literally thousands of people who could prove that they're Jesus. Right? And that obviously can't be true because there's only one of us. So, so I find a lot of these questions quite, quite laughable, actually, in terms of the lack of logic that's present. And in fact, I would suggest to people who ask these kind of questions that you need to go and do a course in logic, right? Because, because without a course in logic, you obviously don't understand much at all. And a course in logic is if I can speak Aramaic, then all it proves is that I, that I speak Aramaic. That's all it proves. It doesn't prove anything else. It doesn't prove my identity as Jesus. It never can, in fact, prove my identity as Jesus. And if you believed that I was Jesus just because I could speak Aramaic, then in my opinion, you're, as, you're crazier than I am. <laughs> like, honestly, if you believe that that's true, then you're crazy. Of course it's not true. Yeah. Go on, what are you going to uh, ask? Um, also... Oh, not many people actually speak Aramaic, do they? Of course. So, so like I find that humorous as well. Like the dialect of Aramaic that we spoke in the first century it has not been spoken for nearly 2,000 years. So how would anyone ever know that I'm actually speaking the Aramaic that I spoke in the first century, even if I could speak it? No one, what, who's going to be around to validate the test? Certainly not the person who can't speak Aramaic at all. How can that? But I could be speaking gibberish for all they know. <laughs> and just because I go blah, 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 and, and speak some Aramaic to them, what they're going to believe that now I'm Jesus because I'm speaking. And by the way, a spirit could overcloak me and speak the dialect of Aramaic that I spoke 2,000 years ago. But what does that prove? Nothing at all except that I'm able to be overcloaked by a spirit who speaks Aramaic. Nothing else. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about this um, in terms of um, we've established that it's not logical that just because a person speaks Aramaic that's proof that they're Jesus. Not at all. What about the fact that you are saying that you have memories of mm -hmm. the last 2,000 years mm -hmm. and someone might assume that part of those memories would be language. Mm -hmm. So can you explain what, what's going on there? Sure. For the last 2,000 years, um, after I left the earth, I never spoke a language. Uh, we spoke in thought packages that can be transmitted into any language uh, from one person to another and through feelings. So, so for 2,000 years, I haven't spoken a language as people on earth interpret a language to be. And language is a very uh, impure and inaccurate way of, conform of transferring information, M mostly because I have to have a feeling, then it turns it into a thought that I have to accurately describe. Then these thoughts need to be turned into a language that then, and the language has to be able to accurately describe the thought as well as the feeling. I transmit that to you through my voice. You then hear it as a language. You've then got to transmit it back to a thought and then down into a feeling for you to understand how I feel about a certain subject. Now, there is a whole heap of levels of distance from my original emotion in that process. You've got the transmission of a thought, transmission of a language, the retransmission of a language into thought, and the thought into an emotion. And so there's a whole heap of errors that, are, that arise and do always arise, in fact. You see it constantly in day-to-day -day life on Earth, all these errors that arise due to this inaccurate way of transmitting feelings from one person to another. Now, in the spirit world, we transmitted feelings as they were. And if a person could feel them, they were open to those feelings, then they'd understand completely accurately what was being felt and therefore what was being thought. On Earth, that rarely occurs. It's very rare for another person on Earth to actually accurately understand what you feel, no matter what language you use mm -hmm. and no matter how much you tell them something. And, uh, and so I feel the process of language on Earth is very limited. Now, if you examine that and understand that I haven't used language for that period of time, and in fact, I don't actually enjoy the use of language for, those, for these reasons because I find it's often misinterpreted, and um, then you can see that I probably haven't had interest, much interesting language for nearly 2,000 years, actually. Mm 
Mm. Now, while I could speak some languages in the first century, they were languages that I learnt from as a child. I spoke three languages in the first century, not Aramaic only, but also Hebrew and Greek. And these are languages that I learned through my study, both usually of the, Bi of the Bible or what was known to be the Bible at that time. So the Jewish books of the Bible. The Jewish books yeah. of the Bible. And also, some, and also because I lived in, up until the age of 12 in, in near Alexandrina in, the, in, in Egypt, uh, well, Alexandria in Egypt, I uh, spent a lot of time uh, in the synagogue and, and conversing with people who spoke Greek as well as Hebrew and Aramaic. So, so I learned all three languages as I was growing up, just like the average person on earth would do if they lived in a household with three languages. Mm. Now, those languages are not important to me. They're never going to be important to me. And, and in the end, while I might be able to speak them once I remember everything from my soul, which remember I said is a process of releasing fear. So as I release fears, I will get closer and closer and closer to everything that I remember. Everything that I remember will have clarity, including language. But I suggest to people that I won't be able to just speak Aramaic. I should be able to speak almost every language of the earth, given the fact that I've interacted with almost every language of the earth over 2,000 years through the transmission of thought. So, so I feel that the whole concept of me speaking Aramaic, when the whole concept should be, you should be able to speak any language on earth, <laughs> is interesting in itself. Second, secondly... The only reason why I can't speak any language on earth is because of fear. It's because of fears that I have within myself that prevent me from this assimilation of the knowledge that comes from my soul that doesn't prevent it in other areas because I have no fear in those particular areas. All I need to do is work through those particular emotions and as I do, things will have a lot more clarity. And therefore, I might be able to speak these languages, but even if I can speak every language on earth, it's still not proof that I'm Jesus. Mm. All it's proof of is that I can speak every language on earth. That's the only thing it proves. So could I ask a little bit of clarity there? You sure. spoke about how it might be possible in the future as you remove more fear for mm -hmm. you to remember not just Aramaic but many other languages. Hebrew, Greek initially and then mm -hmm. the other, other languages. So just for people who've never met you before, um, this certainty that you're Jesus, did that, and all of these memories of 2,000 years of life, did that happen very suddenly? No. No, okay. it's happened over a period of time. So, so as I've released fear, I remembered more things. As I release another fear, remember more things. As I release another fear, remember more things and so forth and so forth. And this has been going on now for 17 years of my, well, it's actually all of my life in this life, but for the last 17 years in a more active way and for the last nine years in a more direct way because I then had to come to accept a few things that I wouldn't psychologically accept before then. So it's going to be a process like that from now on as well. Mm -hmm. I'm going to continue going through this process. As long as I re allow the release of fear, I will also allow the return of the memories. When I say the return, they're still there. All well, the memories are there. It's just my ability to psychologically accept them will be determined by the fear that I'm in. So would you say it's similar to someone who has, a similar but not the same perhaps, as someone who has some fear about an accident that happened when they were a child and because of that they block the memory Certainly. of that. Yep. It's exactly the same as that. Yeah. Or you could say it's almost the same as Alzheimer's in some ways. Uh -huh. And Alzheimer's occurs because people do not want to remember certain things and as a result they start closing down their ability to remember. The memories are still stored within their soul and in their, and in, in their case in their spirit body's mind but they're not accessible because of this desire to close them down, because of the emotional impact that these memories may have in terms of their life. And for this reason, a lot of people close down their memories from childhood in particular, but also as people get older, oftentimes from all of their life, they close down their memories. Mm. They can't remember things. You know, I was speaking to my mother the other day and she can't remember smacking me across the face when I was 15. Why is that? Because she doesn't want to remember it. Mm. She doesn't want to remember because it has some emotional hurt for her, some emotional pain. Like, I remember it, my sister remembers it, <laughs> my brother remembers it, but yeah. she doesn't remember it. 
And, and so this is an indication of what happens to memory. When we have fear associated with memory, we do not remember things, and it's a fact of life. Okay, so what has been the content of your memories so far? I mean, are they events? You, we're talking about language here. Um, <clears throat> why have you remembered some things and not language, I suppose I'm asking? Well, um, firstly, I've never viewed language as very important. Uh -huh. So I've never had a much of a focus on remembering language. In fact, I feel language has many flaws, as I've explained. And so um, I'd prefer to be able to transmit emotions than transmit language. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are many other things that I remember because I have a deep desire to remember them. So things about God, for example, God's laws. I've always had a fascination, deep desire, no fear about those kind of things. So these are the things I remembered first. Mm -hmm. I remembered the process of coming back to earth and the process of you know how we came back to earth, but only after I dealt with a lot of fear. And I, I was in fear for months on end before I, dealt, before I allowed any of these kind of emotions. So there are some times when I dealt with lots of fear and I remember something, and then there's other times when I have no fear and so I remember those things very easily. Now, the majority of things that I'm teaching people at the moment are things that I have no fear about. And so therefore I can easily remember them and easily um, transmit them to others using the best possible language I can given the fact that I'm very limited with English <laughs> as well as any other language. And, um, and all I can do is explain myself in different ways until people understand. And, uh, and because I have no fear on these particular subjects, um, it is very, very easy for me to explain these particular things and remember them. Of course, the things that are more personal in my life, so the things that have happened to me personally in the first century, all through the spirit world and on earth, are much more personal in terms of my fears. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, they are harder to remember. Many of the personal things are much harder to remember as a result of the fears that I have. So as I've released fears, then I remember more things. So, so for example, there was a time when I didn't remember much of my life in the first century, and now I remember a lot of it because I have released fears about different things that allowed me to remember specific events. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. There's just a point about your physical body and your spirit body being different. Yeah, well, that's true too. The spirit body and the physical body is different uh, to my soul. So for the average person who are on earth in their first incarnation, they have a soul or half of a soul connected to their physical body and spirit body. So everything, every experience that their physical body has had, their soul has had. Every experience that their spiritual body has had, their soul has had. In my case, because we're connecting, and in every one of the cases of any of the 14 who have returned, in our case... The soul has been around for 2,000 years, but the bodies we're connecting to have only been around, in my case, for 51 years, right, since the time of conception. Now, since I've only been around since the time of conception, my physical body and my spirit body only remember events in this life. And it's only my soul that remembers all the events of all of my life. So it depends upon how much I allow this connection with my soul as to how much I will remember. And how much I allow the connection is determined by fear, as I said. So while I'm afraid about certain things, so for example, if I'm afraid of what will happen to my physical body, then I'll only remember certain things. If I, if I release that fear, then I'll remember a lot more things and so forth. Hmm. So it depends totally on what I remember as to what... Uh, what I remember depends totally on the level of fear that I allow myself to work through at any given time mm. and the level of fear that I allow myself to experience at any given time. Once I allow myself to work through those particular fears, then I have a very complete memory of everything that has occurred. So there are some events that I've done a lot of work processing through my fears and so I remember them vividly as a result and they have no emotional signature anymore and they don't, I don't feel pained by them and I don't feel afraid of them anymore. And so I can remember them very, very well. Mm. There are other events that that doesn't apply to. Yeah. And is there a reason why you've <coughs> chosen English for this incarnation? Well, I suppose there are a lot of reasons for choosing it. It is, it is, one of the, it is the most widely spoken language on the planet to a, to a degree. 
in terms of the amount of countries that speak it. Um, and the media, would you say? And I suppose, yeah, the there's the media issue. Most of it in, is very much based on English. And, and there are also, like it is, because it is widely spoken in the Western world, there is a lot of effort and time put into translation into English from other languages. So it would make sense for anybody who returns to Earth to, to probably speak English as their first language or their second language at least. Uh, which, of course, all of the 14 can do. So while others of the 14 know Spanish and French and Vietnamese and, you know, Afrikaans and other languages, um, the reality is that all of us also know English. Yeah. As I said before, it's completely unimportant what language I speak on Earth. What's more important is whether I'm logical, whether I make any sense or not. Whether when people listen to me, they realise that there are things that are said that are truth or not. That's the most important thing I would have thought. If I was listening to another person, I wouldn't be concerned about what language they're speaking. I'd be concerned about whether what they're saying makes any sense and whether what they're saying I can put into practice and actually prove whether it's true or not. That's what I'd be concerned about if it was me looking at this question as to whether I can speak Aramaic or not. Well, to me, it makes no difference. What what matters, can I speak logic or not? <laughs> and I feel for the majority of people, um, they have a lot of difficulty with logic because of their emotional belief systems. And I feel that's one of the reasons why logic is often thrown out of the window and people then accept belief systems which are illogical. Mm. Certainly from my perspective, I find it uh, crazy that when people are sitting in front of you interviewing you they want you to speak Aramaic or turn water into wine when I would think wouldn't like world peace or a connection with God be yeah, far more to, relevant to, to a discussion like with Jesus a more questions <laughs> yeah that, that could be asked that are higher priority than those yeah, yeah. Mm. okay why don't you turn water into wine to prove that you're Jesus <laughs> Well, I feel this is just as illogical and unreasonable as the previous question, actually, in terms of why I didn't, you know, speak Aramaic. Firstly, um, it presumes that in the first century I did turn water into wine, which I did not. So it, it also presumes that turning water into wine would be a loving thing to do, which it is not. <laughs> in fact, it would be far better to turn wine into water <laughs> from, a, from a health perspective than it would be to turn water into wine and uh, in fact I have no aversion to turning wine into water but I would have a lot of aversion to turning water into wine. It, again it's one of these things that never happened in the first century that I'm often asked to perform in order to prove something. If I could do it the only thing it logically proves is that I can turn water into wine. That's all it proves. It doesn't prove anything else. It doesn't prove that my identity is Jesus. It only proves that I can turn water into wine. So, to me, the whole it's pointless to even attempt such a thing. Why would I want to attempt turning water into wine when I know that wine contains alcohol? Alcohol destroys brain cells, and so therefore is unloving for me to imbibe or encourage anybody else to imbibe. Unfortunately, also, alcohol encourages overcloaking by spirits because there are dark spirits in the spirit world who don't get to drink alcohol in the spirit world and all they want to do is overcloak somebody on earth so they can drink alcohol through them. And this is why we have so many people who are drunk on earth who are standing up and can't even remember who they are anymore because they're completely overcloaked by another person. Now, do I want to encourage all of that behaviour? No, I don't. I will never want to, actually. So I will never turn water into wine, ever. That's the reality. I might turn wine into water, I don't know about that. <laughs> but to be honest with you, I can turn wine into water with a Bunsen burner and a few you know, pieces of stainless steel. You know? so, um, so that can all be done quite easily as well, <laughs> doing, doing it the other way. So I feel, again, this uh, question is really based around the Bible and the Bible, the presumption that the Bible is speaking the truth about my life in the first century, which it is not. It's also this presumption that uh, I should do things in order to prove myself, which if I was loving, I would not do. I would only do it if I was narcissistic and self-involved and egotistical. 
and I'm not going to do those things because I'm not any of those things. So um, I feel again that uh, this question of proving myself because of the a miracle, uh, in this case turning water into wine, is really a very, very flawed logical proposition and it contains no... Um, like, and it contains nothing real about it in terms of what is the reality of what I'm teaching or any of those kind of things. What is the truth of God? What is the truth of the universe? These are all just questions that people ask, thinking that they're stumping me in some way um, and thinking that somehow they're going to convince me that I'm not the person that I know I am, <laughs> and which is never going to happen, actually, mm. because I know who I am. So. So when you said it's illogical, mm -hmm. um, do you mean by that that if you could turn water into wine, it wouldn't necessarily pr prove anything? Or It doesn't prove anything other than that I can turn water into wine. It doesn't prove that I'm Jesus. And it also, ha is the, it also contains the presumption that I turned water into wine in the first century, which I didn't do. It also contains the presumption that turning water into wine would be a loving act, which it is not. So none of those things, uh, it presumes a lot of things, all of which are incorrect. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and obviously, if I'm going to do something unloving, I can't engage God's laws, as I've mentioned before in another question. The reality is God's laws can only be engaged under certain conditions. And if I'm choosing to engage God's laws for self-aggrandizement in some way, so, you know, to make myself appear better than others in some way, or in order to damage another person, of which this particular thing would do both, mm -hmm. and then I would be completely out of harmony with love and therefore unable to complete the task anyway. So I feel a lot of it comes from these deep misunderstandings people have about God's laws. They don't understand that all of God's laws are loving and all of God's laws involve love. In order to engage them, they must involve love. No so-called miracle, and remember I said in previous question that I don't believe there's any such thing as a miracle. No so-called miracle, or what I would call, no engaging of a higher law of God that people on earth don't know about, can be done without love being involved. So love is essential part of any one of these laws being engaged. And bearing in mind that turning water into lime would not be a loving act on a number of levels, it would be impossible to achieve, in my opinion, without there being some kind of dark influence being involved. And even then, I doubt whether it's possible to achieve. From a purely scientific perspective, water does not contain the same ingredients that wine contains. Water is water, H2O. They, it contains a simple amount of elements, two elements, Wine contains many, sometimes hundreds of elements in, in it that would have to be gathered from somewhere in order to, be, to convert water into wine. So from a scientific point of view, converting water into wine would have to go through a process in order for it to occur. So you're saying there's no magic tricks. There's always got to be a science that underlies the science, miracle, science the so-called miracle. Everything. Every yeah. miracle, so-called miracle that's ever been performed there is a scientific explanation for that's reality. And I find it quite funny in some ways that I'm asked by atheists to turn water into wine into, in, and my not doing so proves to them that I'm not Jesus. They don't even believe in Jesus. They don't even believe Jesus existed. They don't believe in the Bible. So therefore they don't believe that Jesus ever turned water into wine because they don't believe in the Bible. And yet I'm up being asked to perform some fictitious thing that they know is not possible scientifically. Well, I know it's not possible scientifically too. Like, I'm not stupid. <laughs> so so I, I am constantly amazed at the lack of logic, even in so, these so-called atheists, asking me to perform a miracle that is scientifically not possible to achieve without gathering other elements other than water together in some manner. And, and it proves nothing aside from that I could do it, even if I could do it. It doesn't prove that I'm Jesus. It doesn't prove my identity. So again, I feel it's a very flawed argument, very flawed questions that I'm frequently asked by people in the media and other people who believe themselves to be clear thinkers. And they call themselves sceptics, but I, I, can't, I don't even think they're sceptics because a sceptic is a logical person, a person who actually looks at something from a logical perspective and then is sceptical only because of logic, not because of their emotions. And these kind of people obviously are not clear, clearly thinking logically, so therefore they are being driven by their emotions. 
They're being driven by their emotion to prove that there is no such thing as, you know, God's truth. You know, they they want to prove that there's no spirit world. And as I've said, in the future they'll find out that they're wrong. And and in fact they'll realise that they were quite silly making these presumptions that they had no evidence to support. So I have uh, no evidence myself to support the fact that water can be turned into wine. I, I don't know if it can be done at this point in time. I believe that for it to be done, the elements which involve grapes and other things <laughs> other than just water, the elements would have to be present. Now, there may be a way that I can do that in a very rapid way in the future, engaging some laws. I don't know. There might be a way that humankind can do it in some way after they engage God's laws. I don't know those laws that are involved in that particular process at this point in time. However, I'm pretty sure and I know for certain that I did not know them in the first century and so therefore never turned water into wine in the first century. And I don't believe that, uh, that anybody who thinks I did is actually thinking very logically either because I would not do something that's unloving. Great. Now, if you're talking about dehalkalized wine, well, that's a different matter altogether. <laughs> I might consider that. Because <laughs> obviously alcohol destroys the brain cells in particular. It has a detrimental effect generally on our body. And, uh, and my belief is that uh, the only reason why it seems to have a good effect on people's bodies is because they're full of stress and they need to release some stress. So I feel that I would never engage that particular process of turning water into wine uh, that's alcohol. Mm. Why don't you insert any miracle or sign or wonder here in this uh, sentence uh, to prove that you are Jesus? So why don't you do a thing to prove that you're Jesus? Well, I already know who I am. Um, so there's no point in me performing any miracle in order to prove that I'm Jesus because I already know who I am. I don't need to prove to myself who I am because I know who I am. And I don't need to prove to anybody else who I am because I'm not egotistical. I don't, I don't need them to believe me. I don't need them to, you know honour me or respect me or treat me in any possible way that people think that I expect. And for that reason I don't see any purpose to proving that I'm Jesus. By the way, proving that I'm Jesus is quite difficult and I'll talk maybe in another question about how difficult it is going to be to prove that I'm Jesus from a logical perspective, not from an illogical one. Mm -hmm. But uh, I have no desire to prove that I'm Jesus because, because I don't believe that's the point. Anyway, I know who I am. The people who have come with me know who I am. Um, other people will know who I am sooner or later. It doesn't matter to me when they know. For the majority of them, it might be a lot later than sooner. And um, that doesn't concern me very much. All that, all that concerns me is that I can just live here on earth, teaching the things that I wish to teach that I know are true, and that, uh, and, and that I can enjoy that process. Uh, it doesn't even matter if nobody listens to it in the end, to me. It matters to them, because if they don't listen to it, they're going to find their life a lot harder than, than, than it needs to be. That's the reality, but it doesn't matter to me. I don't need people to believe who I am in order to have some kind of narcissistic, egotistical you know, feeling within myself satisfied. I don't, you know, I don't feel any need for people to uh, believe who I am in order for them to come to terms with something about me. I feel the more important thing is that they come to terms with things about themselves and they look at themselves and they examine themselves from a perspective of love and they, and they attempt to connect to God and if they really want to connect to God they do well to listen to what I'm saying to them because I know how to connect to God. That's the reality. Because I have connected to God and, and done so for 2,000 years. So if they listen to me about all that, they'll have a lot better ways of doing that if they listen. But I don't feel they have to listen. You know, it's just a choice. Just like it's a choice whether they believe me or not or accept me or not or even listen to me while I'm saying that I'm Jesus. The majority of people don't listen to me when I say that I'm Jesus about any subject, even 
you know, even a subject that's not related to whether I'm Jesus or not. <laughs> and uh, I find that quite amusing too. But, but there's not much I can do about that. And also there's not much I want to do about that. I don't believe I need to prove to people anything about my own identity. There is a lot of things that I want to prove about God and that I want to prove about God's laws. And I'm already engaged in the process of attempting to prove those things. But there's not much I want to prove about myself. So what about the idea that if you did do X miracle, whatever it is, a lot more people might take you seriously or take your claim that you're Jesus seriously? Well, that might be true, but unfortunately they still wouldn't understand very much because if the only reason why you listen to somebody is that they perform a miracle, then uh, it, it's not a very good reason to listen to somebody. Like, there are many miracles, or what people call miracles on this earth, that are very, very dark and evil, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, that, are, that where dark spirits overcloak a person and they do something that is actually very, very damaging to others. Now, if you then listen to that person for the rest of your life, you're going to be in a lot of serious trouble in your future, particularly after you've passed into the spirit world and you start recognising all of the laws that you break in that place. So I wouldn't recommend that to anyone at all. Just because somebody performs a miracle or what seems to be a miracle on this planet, it doesn't mean you should listen to them. What, when I think you should listen to somebody is when they show you what love is and when they explain the truth to you and when they are willing to give you information, and when they are willing to you know, be open and, uh, about what is truth, rather than closed down and deceitful about it. They are the kind of people I feel you should listen to. And there are many people who do perform so-called miracles on earth through the help of spirits, of course, who are in the spirit world performing these miracles through them, that people on earth believe are miracles, that have very, very dark intentions, and are very unloving as individuals. And I suggest to the people on earth that you don't need to listen to those kind of people either. You need, you need to examine things from a perspective of love. Now, if we're examining things from a perspective of love, then you could see you could dismiss a lot of information that comes to you because a lot of stuff that comes to us is not very loving. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of stuff presented by the media is not very loving. And a lot of stuff presented by people generally to us is not very loving. And we can dismiss a lot of information that way if we use love as our filter rather than whether a person performs a miracle as our filter. So you're really saying that signs and miracles and wonders on this planet are not necessarily a good measure of love because no. there's a lot of other processes that could come into play. Exactly. There's a lot of laws that can be engaged by people who are evil in their intentions and, and I choose not to engage them, but if a person was evil in their intentions, they do choose to engage them, which would be seemingly miraculous at the time to other people, but which are not very helpful to their future progression in love mm -hmm. and certainly not helpful for their relationship with God. Mm -hmm. But those people are engaging some of God's laws but in a dark way. Yes, their... so it's, like, it's like a lot of God's laws. So, for example, if we examine a lot of God's laws and now we're entering a philosophical discussion, and that's fine, but... But if you examine a lot of God's laws, you will see that God has given us this beautiful gift and then if we use it badly, it becomes like a weapon. Mm -hmm. So, for example, sex is a beautiful gift and if we engage it in harmony with the laws of God, it will remain such for the rest of our existence. But if we engage it out of harmony with the laws of God, it can become a weapon so much that diseases and viruses and even death can result from the use of sex. So this is an example of how laws can be engaged in a positive or negative direction using our will. So once we come to understand a law, we can use it positively or negatively. Now, mankind came to understand the law of how to split the atom, as the saying goes. Mm -hmm. And the very first use of it was to destroy hundreds of thousands of people. That's man's darkness mm -hmm. that causes that. So God allowed the possibility of the discovery of these laws. Once man discovers them, many times mankind used them negatively. The whole flight was, you know, controlled flight developed in the early 1900s. By 1914 it was being used to drop bombs on people. Mm 
Mm-hmm. That's man, and the made man uses God's laws. Now, I choose to not use God's laws in those ways. For that reason, I am not going to perform any miraculous thing until all of the things that I do are in harmony with all of God's laws. I'm not going to allow myself to be overcoaked by spirit and perform things like other people on earth are currently doing. I'm not going to allow that to occur because I don't believe it's in harmony with God's laws mm. of love. It's a, it's a way of using the law as a weapon. And I don't agree with that. And, and this, is a, this comes down to man's will and how man chooses to use his will. I choose to use my will in harmony with God's laws of love. The average person on the planet chooses to use their will out of harmony with God's laws of love. And the average so-called leader on the planet, whether it's political, religious or otherwise, chooses to use many of God's laws out of harmony with love. That's the average thing that we see happening on the planet. My suggestion is that we need to stop honouring these people who use God's laws out of harmony with love and see it for what it really is. Just a wicked way of using a knife, if mm-hmm. you like. You see, a knife can be a gift if we need it to cut up some food or we need it to pry open something for some survival purpose. It can be a gift. But if you stab it into the heart of somebody, it's a weapon mm-hmm. that is now being used the gift that we had that is now being used for an evil purpose. And there are many things in God's universe that are like that, where God gives us the choice of how we're going to use the gifts we're given. Now, my suggestion to people is that if they want to engage all of God's laws, only use the gifts you're given for loving purposes. And that's the only reason why I would ever choose to do something that other people would view as miraculous. Only to use the gift as a, for a loving purpose. Mm. Do you feel that it's... Un, you've mentioned that you feel it would be unloving to do a miracle in order to prove that you were Jesus. Definitely. Why is that? Because it's selfish. The only motivation for doing so would be that people listen to me or you know, listen, or that I prove who I am to people and I don't see that as a loving motivation. Wouldn't it be loving if people listen to you more since you have some really good things to help them to improve their life and their relationship with God? Only if, it, if, it, if I'm also in the right motivation. So if my motivation is, is e- egotism or selfishness, or self-aggrandizement, or you know, or glory, then my motivation is impure, and I would suggest anybody don't listen to me if you feel that that's what I'm like, because it, it's not it's not a good reason to listen to anybody. I feel mm-hmm. you want to listen, no matter what they've got to say, really. And I feel the time to listen to a person is when what they say makes sense, and the person themselves lives in harmony with what they're teaching, and lives in harmony with love. And it's not loving for a person to put themselves above you. It's not loving for a person to make themselves better than you. So just because I'm saying I'm Jesus, don't assume that I'm saying that I'm better than you. I'm saying I'm a person the same as you. I know more than you do, only because of certain things that have happened. But it's not, I'm not better than you. And God, from God's perspective, I'm your brother. I'm, you know, you're my sister. I'm the same as you are in terms of this, I deserve the same amount of love from God that you deserve. I deserve the same amount of respect that you deserve. I don't deserve anything more or less. And presumably from that statement, um, you are not more able or less able to perform miracles than any other person. Exactly. I am not more able or less able to perform miracles than any other person. If we think of miracles as being something that people on earth don't understand as a normal thing that would occur... Well, I don't see it that way. I see it as just an engagement of law. Other people can engage the law just the same as I do. They can perform the same things as I do. Ironically, the Bible actually says that. In fact, the Bible says that they will perform greater works than I performed. That's what the Bible says. And is that true? Well, it's possible, yes. It's definitely possible. It's possible for every single person on earth to perform greater works than what I perform. That's possible, but only by engaging the law. 
only by engaging the law of love. It's certainly possible because God made it possible. All of us are equal, and as soon as we engage the laws that, that determine what happens, then anything can be accomplished. That's reality. And so then, presumably, when you engage the laws in harmony with love, then there might be a loving purpose to perform a miracle which may prove your identity to others? Well, I can't see how it would logically prove my identity to others. Mm -hmm. It may prove that I have the ability to engage the law. Mm -hmm. That's all it improves, really. Yes. See, see this, is what I, this is why I think people's logic is flawed. Just because I engage a law that other people cannot engage, that then causes me to be able to do something in the future that other people cannot do, it still doesn't prove that I'm Jesus. Well, and you're saying that other people cannot engage. Surely they can engage it. Well, they can engage it if they engage the same law. Yeah. But if they're not in the same condition, they won't be able to. This I is see. what I'm suggesting. I see. So if they're not in the same condition as I, they will not be, perform be able to perform the same task, if you like, which is engaging the law in a certain direction. Yes. Now, now, when they get into the same condition, they will be able to perform the same law. Once mm -hmm. they have the same knowledge and they have the same amount of love, they'll be able to perform the same thing, exactly the same thing. It's immaterial to God whether you're Jesus or Joe Blow, right? <laughs> yeah. The law engaged will result in the result that it always has. All of God's laws work in this manner. The law engaged always has a result. So this is very disappointing for most people because... <laughs> I, don't, I don't see why it should be disappointing because basically what I'm saying is every one of them can do what Jesus did. Why would that be disappointing? Because there's no way of uh, them suddenly Jesus arriving and them having proof of it and feeling more relaxed about the fact that you're back and going to fix everything. Yeah, but this is, a, this is another thing. I cannot fix anything. Like... The reality is, if God is not already fixing it, then it can't be fixed unless something else happens. Right? Well, couldn't that be you coming back? No, not at all, because it's it needs the will of the individual collectively used in order to fix things. One person cannot force his will upon another. So even though I would like to fix things, I cannot fix them without other people's will being engaged along the same directions of love that my will is being engaged. That's the only way that things are going to get fixed. It's impossible for me to fix things any other way. I can't come as some all-conquering warrior on a white horse with a sword and slaughter all the people, besides being unloving, and slaughter all the people who are wicked, my definition of wicked, of course, and, and keep all the people who are righteous, my definition of righteous, you know, I can't do that. It's impossible for me to do that and stay in a condition of love. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if I did that, I could not engage any law. So I certainly couldn't engage a law where I'm riding a horse in the air. I couldn't engage that law under those circumstances because all of God's laws revolve around love. And since all of God's laws revolve around love, it's impossible for me to take an action that's unloving and remain in harmony with the law. And for that reason, I would have to break the law with its subsequent penalty. So basically, you're back here. You're not going to perform any miracles tomorrow, especially not just for the purposes of putting everyone's mind at ease. Correct. Or, and you're basically here to teach us how to embrace our own will in harmony with the laws that God has already defined. And you are yourself in the process of engaging your own will in harmony with these laws again. Exactly. And it's not completely in harmony with them again. No, not yet, because, uh, because I still have fear. Mm -hmm. while, I re re while fear remains in me, it's impossible for me to engage all of God's laws in harmony with love. Fear must be experienced and released in order for it to leave me. Once that happens, then I become more in harmony with God's laws of love. The more in harmony with God's laws of love I become, the more potential there is for me to do things which other people cannot do, which other people may view as miracles, but which I don't see as miracles at all. Mm -hmm. I see them as just engaging the law. Right? As to me, it's a scientific process that makes a lot of logical sense if you think about it. And we can see that scientific process in, in progress through humanity's history, through all sorts of developmental areas. It's the same process that I'm engaged in. I'm just engaged in it at the soul level, which the majority of people don't even believe exists. Mm -hmm. So I'm just engaged in it on a different level. 
So your return is not really the return of turning water into wine or walking on water or turning loaves into fishes. And neither it, was my first visit the same. Yeah, it, most of those things I never did. <laughs> it's really about, from what you're saying, creating um, awareness of an opportunity that exists for individuals. To if, get into more harmony with God's laws of love and therefore be able to be more powerful in the way in which we express ourselves and create in the universe, yes. Which sounds exciting, but probably exciting. could be a bit of a letdown to people. Well, I suppose... Who have a like different I, expectation. Certainly. If a person has an expectation that I come and solve all their problems for them, that's never going to happen. I can't solve all of their problems for them because they created most of their own problems. And as a result, I, I, it's not right for me to solve them. They need to learn how to solve them themselves. Or, mm -hmm. or even better than that would be solve them and stop creating new ones. <laughs> that would be fantastic. They need to learn how to do those particular things. And I've had to do those things too. So I have to go through the process of learning how to do that. Mm -hmm. and, and I am continu continuously in that process. And that's the process that everyone else is in too. So I feel on, on one level the second coming, if you like, the second coming of Jesus, which is what we're experiencing, mm -hmm. um, could teach us a lot about the engagement of our own desires, our own passions, our own power, our own all these other things that, that God wishes us to engage and that God has given us the ability to engage individually in, in equality with the same equal stance as Jesus can engage it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I fully expect that there'll be people in the future that engage some of God's laws that I've never known before. And therefore they do something that I view as miraculous until I learn the law, right? That's what I fully expect. And, uh, and I feel that if people understood that, we would have a lot of progression occurring on this planet in lots of different areas. However, the problem of them wanting me to be the solution to all of their issues without them being personally engaged, this is not good. This is uh, actually a flaw in their character and nature. It's a flaw with regard to the issue of humanity's creation. In other words, humanity wants to create badness and then not deal with the consequence. And I can't agree with that. God doesn't agree with that either. God says, if you're going to create badness, you're going to have to deal with the consequence of badness. You know, if you're going to create goodness, then you'll deal with the consequence of goodness. This is part of the law, in fact. So I feel that if people understood that about the second coming, that it would be a, the second coming would be a very powerful help to each individual on the planet. Right? Unfortunately, I don't know how soon that's going to occur <laughs> because I don't have control of people's will. Unlike what the Bible tends to suggest that I do, I don't. I don't have control over people. People will do what they choose to do. And if they choose to reject everything I'm saying until such a point in time in the future, and it will be in the future, at some point they'll accept what I'm saying, and, but it may be well after they've died and passed into the spirit world and experienced life in disappointment there as well before they realise what's going on. And there's no, nothing I can do about that except tell the truth. And this is why I said in the first century, the truth will set you free. The truth has set me free. The truth will set you free. It's only the truth that will set you free. Nobody performing a miracle for you will set you free. In fact, if anything, somebody performing a miracle for you will enslave you because you'll believe you're dependent on the individual, on that person, rather than understanding that you, yourself, personally, can perform the same thing. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. How could you prove that you are Jesus of Nazareth? Well, from a logical perspective, there's only one way that I can prove that I'm Jesus who was born in the first century from parents Mary and Joseph and who had a life of 2,000 years. And that is to provide proof of all the people who've known me over that period of time. So in other words, what I would have to do is get my mum and dad, Mary and Joseph, to come to earth. I would have to get everybody who knew me in the first century to come to earth and I would have to get everybody who's known me in the spirit world to come to earth and, uh, and say that they have known me and how they know me, right? Now, the chances of that happening at this point in time 
are fairly low, although not impossible. There is no other way, though, that, uh, that I can prove that I'm Jesus. Just like there's no other way that you can prove you're Mary Magdalene, there's no other way that Igor can even prove he's Igor. There's no other way that Lena behind this camera can prove she's Lena without getting other people. A document means nothing. Like a driver's licence means nothing. It doesn't prove who you are. It only proves who everybody thinks you are. I think that would be totally gnarly, though, when people say, like, how can you prove it? And you pull out a really old, rickety document. <laughs> old, rackety going, driver's licence from 2,000 yeah, yeah. years ago. <laughs> like, Here's my driver's licence from 2,000 years ago. As if, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's never going to happen, right? <laughs> um, for a lot of reasons. <laughs> so, so the only possible way for me to prove who I am is to have all the people who have been in my, involved in my life over the last 2,000 years cooperate the evidence of my life. So, I mean, I obviously that would be fairly compelling because there's a lot of people. You've been a, alive for 2,000 years and there's a lot of people. Of course. Um, but say it was Igor and he brought in five people who knew him when he was a toddler. Yeah. I could just say, well, I don't know these people. I don't... It, of course. So, so can you see that even after all of the evidence has been presented, you could still choose to ignore all of the evidence? Mm -hmm. That's the reality, right? So, so the sad thing about this particular thing is that it's impossible for me to prove my identity to another person unless I have all the people who have known me for all of my life come to you at some point and talk to you about me and you have to be open to believing them. That's mm -hmm. the reality. Now, on earth at the moment, there's 12 other people who have known me from my first century life. And, uh, and you know, once they work their way through their own issues and problems and emotional issues and their own memories, they will be able to corroborate most of what I'm saying about my identity. However, whether a person on earth believes them or not is completely different. Like, what are they saying about me? That I'm crazy, stupid, delusional, uh, deceitful, and so forth. That's what people are saying about me. Why wouldn't they say the same thing about those people? Well, Or even one more thing, and that is, oh, AJ's just prepped them all, or Jesus has just prepped them all to say that he's Jesus. Manipulated. He's manipulated it all. And Cornelius and myself are often received that accusation. of being manipulated, yeah. right, by myself. Which is not true. They don't know, most people have no idea how we live our lives and what, what kind of character I have. Mm -hmm. um, but they assume that it's true because that's their preferred assumption. They'd like to presume that rather than go, okay, there's people from all over the world who actually know that Jesus is Jesus because they've lived with him for 2,000 years. You know, they don't want to accept that. So they'd prefer not to accept that. So they'll come up with any other explanation. And it's like, and it's like Igor presenting five people, or in my case, I'll be presenting 12 people eventually, probably, that, uh, who've known me in the spirit world, who are now on earth, and everyone will say, that's still not believable. The only other thing is that all the people who are spirits materialise and come to earth so that you can see them, and, and then they all talk to you about me and my life and what happened in my life. And I suggest to people, if that actually happened, the majority of Christians, for example, would say that they're devil and the demons. Right? In other words, they would not believe those people. The majority of other people would uh, you know, have all sorts of different belief systems about where these people came from and what they're doing. A lot of them would never accept what they're saying. Most atheists would never accept what they're saying, even if it happened. Mm -hmm. So, so the problem with this identity issue in terms of proof is this. The only form of proof that I can offer that I'm Jesus is the proof of all of the people that have known me since the time that I arrived on earth in the first time and all the people that have known me in the spirit world. And unless you can see them and hear them and unless you can speak with them and unless you can accept what they say to you, you're not going to be able to believe that's reality. Of course, everyone would, most people would have their own personal measure, wouldn't they? Mm. They would say, oh, well, if he did walk on water, then I'd believe it. Or but that's not if logical. He did... It only proves that I can walk on water. Mm -hmm. It doesn't prove who I am. 
If he did speak Aramaic, then I'd believe him. And that's not logical because if I could speak Aramaic, the only thing it proves is that I can speak Aramaic. Or if he did uh, turn water into wine, walk on water and... Hey, speak Aramaic. Speak Aramaic. It only proves that I can do three <laughs> things now instead of one. <laughs> it doesn't prove that I'm Jesus. It doesn't prove my identity. Logically, it cannot prove my identity. It can only prove that I can do what you know, I did. That's all it proves. As I said, I can never be God. I can never do what God does. So a lot of people come up to me and say, what am I thinking now? And I look at them <laughs> and go, why would you think that I'm even interested in what you're thinking now, let alone <laughs> want to know what you're thinking now, and let alone interest, and, and let alone can think of what you're thinking now? Can you think of what I'm thinking now? <laughs> like, yeah. Like, Again, it's because their belief that I am God, that I should be able to do these things, right? And, and I'm not God. I've stated that categorically. But, of course, people don't want to believe that either. Like, that's how unreasonable people have become when it comes to my identity. I feel for you a lot because I can see that on the earth there are so many preconceived notions mm. about who you should be and who you are and who their Jesus is and how how they would know. Mm. And a lot of it is based on stuff that didn't even ever happen or you were never like. Mm -hmm. uh, and so And stuff that can never happen. Yeah. Even. Like, you know, a lot of them say, Where's what you on your white horse? What you know, why can't every eye see you? Like the Bible said. It's impossible for every eye to see we, we live on a globe, a sphere. Some people point that way and other people point that way. It's impossible for you to even see the sun at the same time. <laughs> so how are you going to see an individual at the same time? It's impossible, right? They're wanting even what is impossible to be true, mm -hmm. right? And it's never going to happen. So they're going to be always disappointed mm -hmm. unless they change their concept of what's possible. Mm. That's the truth. So, yes, I, I sort of see it as unfortunate that... Most people are not very logically thinking when it comes to the issue of my identity. They're not thinking in any logical manner. No scientific, no scientific thought is ever engaged when it comes to these questions because all that they are interested in doing is trying to prove that I'm not Jesus. Well, that's like trying to prove that I am. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. Give that up too. <laughs> it's actually impossible for you to prove that I'm not Jesus unless... You were present in my first century life and through my spirit world and you know I'm not Jesus. That's the only way you're going to prove that I'm not Jesus, in fact. So ironically, the only way that I can prove that I am is also the only way that you can prove that I'm not. I find that quite ironic and quite Logical. funny in a way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I would suggest to people is to even perhaps give up this whole concept of trying to pr prove or not prove that I'm Jesus and, and just listen to what has to be said and work out whether it makes sense, whether it's logical, whether it's loving, whether it's truthful. And make a choice. And make a choice. If you want to listen If you not. want to listen, don't. If you don't want to listen, don't. Yeah. It doesn't worry me. It's only your life that's going to be affected by not listening. Like, so, so, and that's your choice. You're allowed to make that choice. God's giving you the right and the will to make that choice. You're allowed to do it. You don't have to believe that I'm Jesus, so stop trying to force me to believe that I'm not. You don't have to believe that I'm not, so try, stop trying to make me believe that I'm not. You know, like, I don't have to, I, I know what I know, and there's no, no, no one is going to easily change my mind. When I say easily change my mind, they're not ever going to change my mind. I know who I am. I remember my experience. I know who I am. It's just like if someone come along to Igor and said, Igor, you're not Igor, you know. He'll go, well, hang on a sec, I, you know, I know my experience, I remembered my life, I've known everything about my life. Of course I'm Igor, you know, like I know who I am. And, and, and he'd just laugh at them probably. So, hey, you know, and unless they had some, some kind of evidence and some kind of proof that they could bring people in to say, well, actually you were born this person and... And, you know, you were given to your mother and all that, you know, unless there was some kind of documentary proof or proof from an individual perspective, it would be impossible to accept that he isn't Igor mm -hmm. from his own perspective. Just like it's impossible for me to accept that I'm not Jesus from my own perspective. 
So um, I suggest to people that they start thinking a bit more logically about these kind of questions. And like I do feel that at some point in the future, not only will the 14, the 12 who have returned with me, who are currently present on Earth, um, will be able to verify my identity. But also, I will have very many visitors who come from the spirit world who will be able to verify my identity to the average people on Earth. But that can only happen after I go through a process of love that I have to go through, where I release all of my fears and I deal with all of my identity issues myself beforehand then it can all happen. And only then can it all happen. But even when that does happen, it may be that the average person on earth still doesn't accept it because of the things we've already mentioned. Mm. How many people have listened to your teachings? Well, if you include the last 2,000 years of my life, obviously there's been many billions of people that have listened to my teachings. However, if you include this life on Earth and how many people on Earth currently listen to my teachings, there's probably a few hundred thousand people that have listened to my teachings. I know that we've produced around 100,000 videos. I know that there's been about 500,000 views of our videos on YouTube. Uh, I know there are around about, at the moment, around 1,300 regular subscribers to our YouTube channel. Um, so, you know, and I know that I've personally spoken to probably around 20,000 people over the last 10 years. So that's how many people have actually listened to the teachings that I've presented on earth in this life. Yeah, yeah when I say there's 100,000 videos, I mean there's a, we've, we've given away 100,000 DVDs. And so... No, not all of different videos. <laughs> but, you know, there's obviously a significant amount of people in that regard who have heard of the divine truth. If you, if you look at uh, maybe what's happened in the media recently, then, then possibly there's millions of people that have heard of this guy who's in Australia, who's Alan John Miller, who claims to be Jesus, right? But uh, the majority of people don't actually listen to me the majority of people, in fact, uh, spend most of their time trying to criticise me rather than listening to me. So I, wouldn't, I would say that the majority of the 1,300 subscribers to our YouTube channel fall into that category where they're very critical of you know, pretty much everything I say. Because they want to be. As I said, they don't want to accept that I'm Jesus. And they don't even have to accept I'm Jesus. They just don't want to accept what I'm saying, let alone that I'm Jesus. And as a result, they feel very critical. The majority of people who have listened to us in the past don't listen to us now for the same reason. Sooner or later, I say something to them personally or collectively that either challenges them or, or causes them to become afraid of something internally. Usually it's afraid of public opinion or some other kind of fear that they have. It triggers their internal fears. And as a result of that, most of the people don't want to listen after that point. Most people on the planet are only used to listening to somebody who they can agree with. They're only used to listening to somebody who makes them feel good. And I don't do any of those things generally, so the majority of people find me very difficult to listen to for extended periods of time. The majority of people who are listening to me still don't understand what I'm saying either. They think they understand what I'm saying and they try to apply it from an intellectual perspective but they have very little understanding from a soul perspective of what's being said and they don't understand how to release emotion in order to understand. So the reality is that while many hundreds of thousands of people may have heard the message of divine truth this time round on earth at this point in time, uh, very few people actually understand it or actually are engaging it as I engage it. And you mentioned a lot of big numbers about the numbers of DVDs that we've copied and given away and mm -hmm. the, the numbers of views on YouTube and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, is this a static number? Are there, are there the same group of people still listening now as were listening 10 years ago? Are no. there a growing number, a reducing number? Or... 
Well, like everything divine truth, it's a slowly growing number. Now, the reason why it's slowly growing is because most people are very, very um, against receiving truth. Most people are challenged on so many levels when they hear any truth that it takes them a long time before they accept any new truth. Because of that, um, you know, most people who listen to divine truth, who listen to what we teach, eventually leave it because sooner or later it challenges them on some level. However, there is this other quality that exists within the human soul and that is everyone at some point likes hearing the truth no matter how bad it, <laughs> no matter how bad it is when you first hear it. And as a result of that, there is a slowly growing number of people who want to listen to divine truth. Now, I believe that at some point in the future that growth will be more rapid. However, I don't expect it to be more rapid because I know how difficult it is for people to hear things that they've never conceived of before and that challenges all of their belief systems and challenges all of their relationships and challenges their very life and how they live their life. So I understand that hearing the divine truth is going to be very, very difficult for the majority of people initially. But I do also believe that there are many people on earth who want to hear truth at some level. It just depends on whether that level is high enough to exceed the fear they're in. For the majority of people at the moment, the fear takes precedence over their desire for truth. In the future, I'm hopeful that the fear will reduce through their experience of their own fear. And as a result, the desire for truth will be greater than their own fear. And then, of course, more people will listen. And would you say that um, more people have listened and left than have listened and stayed? Certainly. There'd be at least 20 times more people who have listened and left than listened who st than st and stayed. In fact, the majority of those people who listen and leave haven't listened for any longer than two hours. In fact, I would say the majority of them haven't listened for any longer than 15 minutes. And the reason why is because within the first 15 minutes of talking to me, most people were severely challenged. And as a result, they don't want to hear any more. Mm. So, um, and, that, that, and that, of course, includes the people who, as soon as I say I'm Jesus, are severely challenged. The majority of people fall into that category, even yourself, when you first heard, right? So, so the majority of people fall into the category where as soon as they hear that I'm saying that I'm Jesus, they automatically do not want to listen to any more. Now, in the majority of DVDs that I speak, that happens within the first 15 to 20 minutes of the conversation, particularly if they're listening to the secrets of the universe or an overview of divine truth. And for that reason, the majority of people listen to the, for the first 15 to 20 minutes and then as soon as I say that, their fear comes up, their fear of cults or their fear of me or their fear of what other people will think of them or their fear of all sorts of things, most of which they don't even understand, comes into them and then they get angry or they get you know, upset or belittling or whatever and they don't listen anymore. That's the reality of the presentations I give. So these people who accuse me in the media and otherwise, of saying that I'm Jesus in order to get followers, have no understanding of reality. The reality is, when I say I'm Jesus, the majority of people who would normally be willing to listen to me don't listen to me anymore. That's the reality. 